Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Today, to cover a few key multiple myeloma studies from ASH 2023, we'd like to welcome back Dr. Jens Helen Gass from Roswell Park. Jens, the amount of data that comes out each year on multiple myeloma is overwhelming, to say the least. We've picked out four studies that would help our day-to-day -day practice in the community settings with the first-line treatment options, and then we'll also discuss the optimal dosing for our current available options, and then we'll also focus on either cell, the ABECMA CAR-T in refractory or relapse myeloma. Jens, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. As always, a pleasure. Welcome, Jens. We have covered multiple myeloma algorithm with not even about a year ago, and things have already changed since. So that just shows how exciting this field is, and more importantly, how exciting it is to be a community oncologist. <laughs> now, getting started with the first study, Perseus study, which talks about the quad therapy in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patient population with DARA RVD induction in comparison to RVD, followed by transplant, and then consolidation with DARA RVD, and then followed by maintenance of DARA LEN, which is always questionable to continue on for 24 months and what to do after that, or 12 months. Sort of similar theme, which we have seen with Griffin trial for that matter. So what did the study show? And importantly, what did we learn more about this quadruple therapy, what we didn't know from Griffin? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's obviously what, what we were thinking about. And um, the, Dr. Fohis, who published and led the Griffin study, gave the introduction for, for this uh, plenary session, uh, which is actually very exciting for myeloma doctor to have a plenary session and a late breaking abstract. So that's that's good. And both we are talking, uh, both of them we will talk about. So Perseus, I mean, that's what we have started in our center a while ago based on the Griffin data already. Griffin was an earlier study, earlier phase. It had an endpoint with MRD negativity. We did see PFS and overall survival data, but this is obviously a much larger study. It's a phase three randomized study. Um, it is very similar to Griffin, but it, it, it just confirms basically that daratumumab frontline is just a really excellent addition to all the treatments that we have done before. Based on uh, the Maya study with Dara Landex, it's for the elderly or transplant ineligible patients. It was a game changer, and now the Dara with the VRD backbone regimen is just it is just confirming what we expected. But it's good to have it in a large number of patients. You see the p value here, which is really impressive. That the overall survival is not that impressive, I think, is in part because patients got uh, Dara to move up later. Um, but what what is in the myeloma community? What I think most people agree on is right now we have to to use our chances that we have at frontline. We should not be sparing anything at frontline. And the next study we will talk about will confirm that because at frontline, the disease is not as mutated, not, not as evolved as it, is, as it is later. Another factor is also that at frontline, the, dis the disease burden is very high because we didn't know the patient has myeloma, so they have the highest tumor burden um, as compared to later on when we at relapse, we know that they have it and we, we catch it early. So I think this is just great showing a very aggressive but still fairly well-tolerated treatment up front is the best that we can do with our myeloma patients. Jens, thank you for covering that. And even before I go on to another quad therapy with another CD38, how much is maintenance therapy buying us here with uh, Dara Len or in next page we'll see with isotuximab? Yeah. So that's of course it's it's more effort to do this as a maintenance treatment. Is I think it's especially they they showed in the in the talks also this subgroup analysis as far as they were available. High risk patients benefit from more maintenance than just lenalidomide. Lenalidomide is around for a very long time, as you know. Dr. McCarthy from Roswell has, has shown that many many years ago that lenalidomide is a great maintenance even in high risk patients. But it looks like, especially uh, for high risk patients, it's very important to bring them in a deep remission, meaning MRD negativity, which is kind of one of our new earlier endpoints because waiting for overall survival can be pretty long for myeloma. Um, so I think. Uh, bringing them in a deep remission. And then the the study did actually 
go until MRD negativity for in a part, and then they went down to lenalidomide alone. So that's something where that could be considered. We don't know yet what that will mean, right? If the patients relapse earlier, if we stop, or if we dose reduce the treatment in the sense of de-escalation uh, without the daratumumab. In my experience, like in clinical routine, we do dara landex maintenance in some patients, especially in high-risk patients, or if they're not in a deep remission. And if they achieve MRD negativity sustained, which is also something we look into, like being a, a year apart, so every 12 months do bone marrow biopsy if they're still MRD negative then it's a point if the patient want to and if, if it makes sense then we stop one of the drugs and just continue with the lenalidomide which is of course convenient for the patients and so far there's no study showing that stopping lenalidomide is beneficial for the patient it might come studies are going on but we don't have this data yet perfect thank you for covering that and staying on the topic of quad therapy and plenary discussions a different anti-cd38 as i mentioned isotuximab with a different backbone, KRD, this was also another plenary discussion. Jens, can you please walk us through this study and its findings? Yeah. So KRD was kind of the second strong combination that we already had. There was a study that was questioning actually if KRD is better than VRD. In our experience, what we have, we have another study that's comparing KRD with a quad. Um, but what we have seen, those patients don't get um, neuropathy that much. And, you know, Valcate, Bortezomib is just has this risk of neuropathy. So KRD is, even if it's not in the head-to-head -head comparison, was not much better, it has a less, less neuropathy signal. And I mean, patients live very long and they therefore live very long with their neuropathy because oftentimes it just doesn't go away. The isotuximab is a little bit more challenging from a convenience perspective because it's IV still, but there's a study going on uh, actually in Germany where I'm from um, where they compared uh, IV versus subcutaneous. So that's helpful for the future. At the moment, I think this is a very, very strong treatment. This data is a little bit less mature than the Perseus study, but it is a, a very, very good treatment, a very strong treatment. Again, a CD38 antibody upfront when we can hit the disease, the the hardest, and you have here also the MRD uh, rates, which are the endpoint here, which is really impressive, is almost not seen before outside of a quad with KRD as the backbone, as you show here. This is just excellent. And you, what's also interesting is that post-consolidation, it's getting even better. So we don't usually do consolidation in clinical routine. We rather give it before stem cell transplant because then, but in the clinical trial, it's difficult to say we do four to six cycles, for example. So in the trial, you have to say, okay, this is a set number of cycles. This is a set number of cycles. But in this case, as you can see, even after transplant, when a lot of patients are already MRD negative, more patients become MRD negative with this consolidation, including the isotuximab. Thanks for going over that. And this is uh, incredibly impressive data, but we'll wait for Germans to lead the way with the subcutaneous <laughs> versus IV so we can use it conveniently. Uh, now, the question is, is MRD, which is the most talked topic as well uh, when measuring this uh, disease state itself, is measurable residual disease the best marker? Should we change our practice based on this while we are waiting on PFS and importantly, the OIS data? Yeah, I think for clinical practice, not that much. For clinical trials, yes, because as, as we just discussed, overall survival can take 10 years longer to read out, and we don't want to wait for a new combination or a new drug to be approved after 10 years, because then it's already, we have five other new drugs, as you know, in myeloma. So um, there's a lot of discussion in the myeloma world and discussion with the FDA to at least um, have kind of as a prelim preliminary endpoint MRD negativity, and then especially sustain MRD negativity, as we discussed earlier, with a year apart or maybe even three years apart, that we can say if a patient is still MRD negative, it has been shown over and over and over again that it correlates with a good outcome later on. There are patients who relapse from MRD, obviously, but um, that is still, it's kind of the earliest, but also a very good endpoint. And it has also been shown that it overcomes to a certain degree if a patient with high-risk disease goes into MRD negativity, and there were also an, another presentation at ASH showing that if the patient go into MRD negativity, this bad prognostic cytogenetics sometimes are not that relevant anymore, at least. 
Thank you. And just to add on to the MRD idea, it's more of a prognostic rather than a surrogate yes. marker. Cool. And Jens, you mentioned about uh, peripheral neuropathy. This is a great segue to our next study where we're trying to optimize the treatment options that we already have, particularly weekly dosing of bertuzumab rather than the biweekly dosing like what it was initially approved. This was presented by Dr. Rahul Banerjee's group, and we continue to see that weekly dosing we're not compromising any outcomes and you have less side effects. What's your clinical practice and how do you dose sportismab in your clinic? Actually, before this was presented, we did uh, maybe a year ago, a pharmacist in our clinic did a retrospective analysis. We had some patients with twice weekly bortezomib, others with weekly bortezomib. We did a comparison. There was no outcome difference, exactly the same what you can see here. So we have changed to every week bortezomib. And um, yeah, so it, it does make sense. And I know a lot of colleagues in the myeloma world do exactly the same, just based on this data and also personal experience. So it's it basically confirms what we have already done. Weekly bortezomib is, is good. And it's also a bit easier, especially, as you said, we want to combine it with daratumumab, which is weekly. And it was always a hassle, kind of when are the four weeks, like the three weeks of of bortezomib and the four weeks of daratumumab, it's just easier and it has less side effects and is similarly effective. So I definitely strongly recommend doing weekly bortezomib. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm actually giggling from inside because of the fact that this was in fact the third study talking about bortezomib weekly uh, doing well because I believe Rahul you did a similar study back in 2017 in Luwo yep. and you were a yep. fellow. Yep. Yep. Doesn't look like that got enough traction because you were part of the study. <laughs> 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 All right, moving Not along. Nice. <laughs> well, the talking about how doing least or less is more for our patients. Similar study was shown uh, to show benefit with low dose dexamethasone to be benefiting patients. Along with that, men, uh, talked about lenalidomide uh, having low dose having similar benefit or same efficacy. So these are important studies to address that that doing less is in fact more optimal for patients, especially when side effect profile is concerned. Yeah, what is I think relevant is that the patients stay on treatment, right? Uh, and if they have side effects, they stop the treatment and they have less effect, obviously, if they uh, as compared to a lower dose that they can give longer, that you can give longer. I think that's kind of a takeaway there too. Sorry, go ahead. Could, no, could, uh, couldn't agree more. Well, moving along to our last study, uh, which is not the least, it is very important, the role of CAR-T in relapsed or refractory myeloma disease. Here we have updates from KARMA-3 study looking at IDASEL or ABECMA. We have a significant PFS improvement here. IDASEL was in fact approved in March 2021 for refractory myeloma. Jens, your take on these findings here. Yeah, I mean, not very surprising, obviously. CAR-T is an excellent treatment. Um, it is, I mean, it's super effective and we learn more and more how to make it very tolerable for the patients. What we have seen in studies, and this is a, a good one because it's very close to the real world, right? It compared everything that you could compare to, to CAR-T and um, the CAR-T is obviously more effective. Um, the side effect profile is very different and obviously you have to send your patient to a center to do the CAR-T therapy, but just the efficacy in, as you can see here, like a median PFS of uh, 10 more months is, is just very impressive. And um, we learn more and more how to treat patients well with CAR T cell therapy. We know that, for example, initially we thought they need a higher tumor burden to be to have a target for these T cells that are manufactured to fight the tumor cells and they proliferate in the body. But what we have seen is that even a lower tumor burden can be very effective. And it seems like a lower tumor burden, meaning also an earlier line of therapy can make it more tolerable. We have shown in another study that uh, I could present the CARDI2-2 study where patients were even uh, after one prior line of therapy got CAR T cells. It was a much smaller study, but uh, we saw that the side effect profile was much really much improved because patients were just in much better shape and there was less tumor burden, so they had less side effects. So this is a super important study and it actually answers the question, in these lines of therapy, is standard of care better than CAR-T? I think looking at this, it's not. 
No, couldn't agree more. It is very impressive. And as community oncologists, we should be embracing these findings, appreciating these findings, because we should send these patients out to tertiary or quaternary care centers to receive these important therapies. Well, uh, we've covered quite a bit here. Quad therapy starting off with exciting data from CAR-T and KARMA-3 update with IDACEL. Believe it or not, CAR-T is also being studied in solid tumors as well. But well, uh, we are far from using it in solid tumors for now. Jens, thank you so much for joining us today and going over these practice changing studies in multiple myeloma space from ASH 2023. Stay tuned for a quick wrap up. Thank you so much. Thousands of abstracts were presented at ASH 2023 with Dr. Jens Hillengast from Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. We have covered four studies in multiple myeloma space. First two looked at the role of quad therapy with anti-CD38, such as daratumumab and isotuximab in transplant eligible patient population. There was improvement with quad therapy, but clear role of maintenance remains unclear. Then we've also discussed optimizing our current available treatment options with a focus on weekly bortezomib rather than biweekly dosing as it was initially approved. Weekly dosing did not compromise outcomes and patients tolerated this better. At last, we focused on an update from Karma 3 study where IDACEL continues to show PFS in relapsed refractory myeloma patient population. Importantly, this also reiterates the importance of us in the community collaborating with tertiary or quaternary centers offering treatment options such as IDACEL to our patients. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to check out our CLL and lymphoma updates from ASH 2023 as well. We are the Oncology Brothers.